What are you hoping for this Christmas? I don't know what's on your Christmas list. Uh, maybe, maybe some of the things that are on the most popular gifts list. The first one is the Ember Temperature Control Smart Mug 2. And I've heard some different prices for it. I saw it for $109, $109.95. But this is not just any coffee cup. You can control the temperature from an app on your smartphone. Oh, my goodness. Probably several of you, that's top of your list for Christmas, I'm thinking, this year. Or what about the moon lamp? I want this. This seems really cool, and it does different colors and strobe effects. Wow, what could be better than a strobe effect moon? I just can't even think. Or how about uh, this uh, TikTok favorite, the original reversible octopus plushie. That way you can let your girlfriend know if you're in a good mood or a bad mood, stuff like that. But maybe are there some things on your list that you could not fit under a Christmas tree? Perhaps some of you are waiting and just wishing for and hoping that your soldier will come home safe and sound uh, from across the, the, the waters. Or uh, maybe you're hoping for someone that you care about to get free from addiction. Some of those gifts would be the best gift of all, and you can't, you can't fit them under a tree. Would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 7, verses 2 to 16? And we're in a series of messages where we're talking about the hope of Christmas. And there is a lot of hope that God gives us through the Christmas story. And we're, we're looking at specific parts of the Christmas story where God turned around an impossible situation and he brought hope where there was no hope. He brings hope where there's hopelessness. In Isaiah 7, this very uh, famous chapter of the Bible, we see that God's people in the nation of Judah were in trouble. And it, this was many centuries before Jesus came, but it kind of sets the stage for when he comes. They, they, they were in trouble because two nearby nations much bigger than them had joined forces and created an alliance, and they were making plans to come and march against Judah. And when the news came to King Ahaz, who was the king at that time, and, the, and his royal family, Isaiah 7-2 says, The hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear, like trees shaking in a storm. And we have had a windstorm over these past few days. Uh, I have had to go out and just put increasingly heavier things on our back patio, trying to keep the rugs and the chairs from blowing off the patio it is crazy. And I don't know if you've ever seen leaves shake. Uh, but uh, there's one window of the house where I look out and I see a neighboring, um, just a neighborhood where there's huge evergreen trees. And it just looked like they were boiling. And I, I just picture the, this, the king of Judah and the royal family with him just so agitated and so scared because what are we going to do? It'd be, it would be sort of like a country coming against a county. That's how it felt to them. And they just were outgunned, outmanned, outresourced. There, there's just no way they could win. So they're, they're so scared. What makes you shake in your boots? If, if that could make a king of a, of a small country, shake in his boots. What makes you shake in your boots? Do you ever feel like the enemy's coming against you or your family? Do you ever worry about your kids when you send them off to school, just wondering what are they going to be taught? Will there be bullies there? What are they going to be exposed to? There, there is, the world today is so crazy. Do you, do you ever feel like anxious? When you compare your paycheck, which is not rising, <laughs> it is just staying steady, with the grocery costs that are rising, like before our very eyes, every time we go to the store, it's a little higher. Uh, I, I was in another store, not a grocery store, I can't remember which store this past week, uh, where they said, oh yeah, they've, they've ra they, uh, one customer was telling another, yeah, they've raised their prices, I think it was for a service. Everything is, but our incomes are staying like this. Is anyone besides me very, very concerned about the state of our freedoms in this country? 
I'm very concerned about that. There's just a lot of craziness going on in our world. Well, the Lord gave the prophet Isaiah, by the way, his name means God saves or salvation of God. The Lord gave Isaiah a message for this king that we're talking about today, Judah's King Ahaz. And Isaiah goes to King Ahaz, and he says, I have a word of the Lord for you, king. God says, I know that two enemy kings have joined forces, and they're coming against you. And it seems like it is all bleak and darkness. But in Isaiah 7, 7, it's written, but this is what the sovereign Lord says. This invasion of these two countries against you will never happen. It will never take place. And then skipping down to the last part of verse 9, unless your faith is firm, God says, I cannot make you stand firm. That's a really unusual sentence from God in a word from God through a prophet to a person. Unless your faith in God is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. So it's almost like God was saying, you've got a choice, king. Are you going to focus on your circumstances and shake like a leaf in a windstorm? Or are you going to focus on me, your God, and stand firm? Because that is what it takes. So in the middle of their scariest time, God was saying to them, if you trust me, there is hope. I know this situation seems hopeless. There's no way, naturally speaking, you could win this battle if it happens. But God is saying, but if you trust me, I am your reason for hope. Your hope is based on me then. So God is saying a firm faith in God equals standing firm in life. A firm faith in God equals standing firm in life. And conversely, as God said here, faulty faith in God or faith in your own resources, that leads to life falling apart. That leads to not standing firm, the opposite of standing firm. So you would think when Isaiah the prophet comes to a king with a very encouraging message, that the king would go, wow, great, and turn his heart back to God because he had turned his heart away. He did not. King Ahaz ignored God's encouragement. Ahaz, behind the scenes, had already bowed his knee to a third country's king, Assyria, and he had said, I will serve you and give you money from the temple treasury if you protect me against my enemies. And Ahaz was counting on Assyria to help him in the hard times of life. How many times do we count on everything else but God, the one who could actually help us in our situation? Even though Ahaz, this king, had turned away from God, making ungodly alliances, and the, the story of his life is in 2 Kings chapter 16, another place in the Bible. He not only made ungodly alliances, but he worshiped false gods at uh, just, at, the Bible says, under every green tree in the land, everywhere there was a shrine, he went and worshiped. He made his own son pass through the fire in a demonic um, ritual. Uh, this was not a very good godly king. Despite that, God loved King Ahaz and his people. God had chosen them and invited them to worship him. And even when they turned away, God still had a heart for them. He still wanted to keep his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and to David before him, and all those other great kings. Even though God loved him, he still had some standards for him. And he still said, you got to trust me. you got to come to me. God wanted so bad to be their hope when times were tough. God likes to turn things around. That's like it delights him. He loves to turn hopeless things upside down and bring hope to them in the midst of hopelessness. So the Lord sent Isaiah to the palace a second time with another message of hope for the king. And this time, it wasn't just the king and, and Isaiah together. 
But it was Isaiah talking to the king with the royal family gathered around him in the palace. And there, Isaiah said, this, here's the word from the Lord. The Lord says to you, king, ask the Lord for a, ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation. Okay, so I've already brought this word of the Lord that God says he's going to take care of you. He's going to turn it around. You're not even going to have to fight this battle. God's going to take care of your enemies. So I feel like you didn't get it that first time, king. So the Lord has sent me again to say, ask God for a sign. And he said, in fact, ask him for the hardest sign, the most epic sign you could think of. Something as high as the heaven or as low as the place of the dead or anywhere in between. Ask God for anything supernatural or natural. And God is, he's kind of making an exception in this. He really wants you to turn to him and trust him. So God says, pick a sign, any sign you want, make it as hard as you want, and God will do it as a confirmation that he's got you in this. I believe this is the only place in the Bible where this exact thing happened, where God said, choose any sign you want, and I will do it. Wow, what an amazing, amazing thing. What an opportunity but Ahaz, the king, refused. You know how, how, how it is. We guys, we don't like to ask directions. He didn't want to sign. He wanted to just figure it out on his own. Well, Isaiah chapter 7, 14, and now we'll get to a verse that you're going to recognize as a Christmas verse. All right then, Isaiah said, feeling a little perturbed by this time because the king is disobeying the Lord. And the king said, no, I'm not going to test the Lord by asking for a sign. Well, it's not testing if the Lord just said to do it. Now it's disobedience. So he's sounding all holy, but he was actually rebelling against the Lord. Isaiah 7, 14, the, the prophet Isaiah says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. He gave you an opportunity to choose, but you didn't do it. So the Lord's going to choose the sign. Look, so here he is, Isaiah, with the king and the royal family. I picture the crown. <laughs> so all the royal family gathered around. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. Now, we always associate this because we're looking backwards at Jesus and then back further to this. But Jesus had not come yet, all right? So this is a prophecy. The virgin will conceive a child. And uh, commentators think that he most likely looked at someone in the room and said, you there, young girl, virgin in the king's family, you will conceive a child. Shocker! She was not planning on it. No one was planning on it. She's just a young girl. And he says to her, you'll be married, and i.e., no longer a virgin, and you will have a baby very soon. But she wasn't planning on that. Oh, the drama. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. I wonder if the girl's name was Marlena. I'm not sure. It might have been. So Isaiah continues with this prophecy, and he says, She will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So imagine, here's a girl, young, a young virgin girl in the king's family. She's not married. I don't know if she was betrothed or not, but I'm guessing she had no plans, because this was kind of like, oh, wow. So in one announcement... The prophet Isaiah brings a wedding announcement, a birth announcement, gender reveal, and a name reveal, <laughs> all in one quick announcement. Wow. And so he goes on to say, uh, in less time than it takes this young royal virgin to get married, have a son, teach him to know right from wrong, say two or three years, in less time than that, God will give you victory over the enemies that are coming against you, and you won't even have to go to battle. God said, in effect, when you see this sign, so can you imagine the prophet shows up and he said, I got a word from the Lord, young lady, you're going to have a son. Wow. And you're going to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God says, when you see the sign, you'll know that I always take care of my people. I am God, he says, and I am with you. I've got your back. I'll defeat your enemies. I'll turn it around. So when God gives you a sign, it always points you to his faithfulness. Yeah. 
because you, you see how faithful he is when he fulfills that sign. And God's faithfulness gives you hope. What do you do when you're worried like King Ahaz? Like maybe when arch enemy like cancer comes and threatening to take your life or when your kids don't feel safe or when your job is threatened, what do you do? Do you fight in your own strength, your own wisdom, or do you go into denial? Do you get mad or do you turn to God? I hope that's what we do. Now, fast forward 700 years after Ahaz. So remember, this prophecy was given to him as a sign. God's going to help him in the next couple of years. That sign had to have an immediate fulfillment, at least a partial fulfillment. 700 years later, another young virgin named Mary was betrothed to a man named Joseph. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him, don't be afraid to marry Mary because the child in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 1, 22, 23, this is what it says. The angel told him, all of this, listen to this now, with all that backdrop I just gave you, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, I notice one little word changed when Matthew quoted Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah said the virgin will conceive and will, uh, a son and will call him Emmanuel, kind of implying that the, the mother, the child's mother, will call him Emmanuel. And that was a very common thing, especially in the Old Testament. It was a prophetic name. God was saying, you name this kid born the natural way, God with us, Emmanuel, because I want you all to know I'm your God. I'm, I'm taking care of this country. I'm with you. But then a virgin conceives and a virgin has a child. That's another step. When Mary had Jesus, she was still a virgin because the child in her was God himself. He was planted there by the Holy Spirit. So now that name, Emmanuel, God with us, is much more powerful, much more meaningful. It's just not that God is with us generally. Now Jesus came, the Son of God, fully God, fully man, and he is literally with us walking among us. There was partial fulfillment back in King Ahaz's day. There was final fulfillment when Jesus came. And no one could have seen this coming. Wow. God himself walked among us. John said we touched him. We touched God because he was one of Jesus' disciples. We talked to God. We hung out with him. We experienced God because Jesus was with us. Emmanuel, God with us. God fulfilled the sign back there for Ahaz. And we know from the timelines of history that the that the, the northern it was northern Israel and Syria where the two countries coming against Judah, they were defeated and their kings were killed. And uh, Judah did not have to go to battle with them. God fulfilled his promise, his prophecy, his promise in the short term right there. But God also fulfilled it ultimately in Jesus 700 years later. Wow. And this, the, the promise started uh, even before God promised that, that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. And he will be called, they will call him Emmanuel. Way back in the Garden of Eden. After humanity sinned for the first time and sin entered the world, God said, I'm starting a plan right now to bring you back into fellowship with me and to forgive your sins and to pay for your sins. And way back in the garden, when God was after the sin, after the fall, God was talking to the devil who had been operating through the serpent. And God said, you watch out because one of the offspring of this woman right here, of Adam and Eve, one of the offspring is going to come back and he's going to strike you on the head and you are going to be defeated. So from the very beginning of earth as we know it, God had been planning yeah. that Jesus would come, Emmanuel, God with us, and Christmas is the day we celebrate that he came. 
Praise the Lord. This is the, this is the answer to our longing, our deepest spiritual need that God has been planning since the, since the earth began and since humanity began. Praise the Lord. But guess what? Jesus, though he was born of a virgin, and he, he, he did not stay a baby. He, he, is, he is the sign that God keeps his promises, but he didn't just stay a baby. He lived a sinless life. He became the perfect sacrifice. He paid for your sins and mine on the cross. And he defeated our enemies. Do you see all the parallels between that first encounter with Ahaz and the enemies and all of that? Jesus came and defeated our ultimate enemy, sin, death, hell, the grave. Jesus defeated those and took the keys back from the devil. God turned it around for you and me spiritually. He changed your destiny. The good news is that eternal life is the free gift of God to everyone who believes in Jesus for it. Eternal life is the greatest gift that you could get, better than an ember thermodynamic 2,000 clausometer mug that you can operate from your, your phone. Eternal life lasts forever. Amen. Starts now, not just starting in heaven, starts now, and just keeps going. And even when this body dies, we live with Jesus forever. And that is the free gift of God to everyone who believes in Jesus for it. In another place in the Bible, in Hebrews 6, 18 to 19, it says, Therefore, we who have fled to God for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. So I just wrap up the message like this. Hope in Jesus is your anchor in the storm. Hope in Jesus is your anchor in the storm. Hope in Jesus is your anchor that keeps you steady in the storm. Now picture an, an anchor on a boat, on a ship. An anchor doesn't do much good if the, the sailors just stand around on dry land looking at that anchor, um, admiring it, oh, wow, man, that metal seems really strong. Wow, that chain seems really sturdy. Like that anchor is not doing much good if it's just sitting there. Without an anchor, if you don't have an anchor, your ship will just drift aimlessly or it's going to be tossed about by every wind, a wave. Unless you drop that anchor and it grabs hold onto solid rock, then you're stable and steady. And your solid rock is Jesus. Hope in Jesus is your anchor in the storm. Not hope in hope, not positive thinking. We know that worry won't change anything. Positive thinking helps you feel better, but our hope is in Jesus. He doesn't change. Unfortunately, our feelings are up and down and all over the place. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Run to Jesus and rest your hope in him. Because hope in Jesus is your anchor in the storm. I, I, I love the song that we sang earlier. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater than the darkness. You light our way, God. You light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. No, even in the darkness of the days we're living in, Jesus is brighter. Amen. Jesus is stronger than any enemy because he has defeated every enemy. The only reason he is not, I believe, the, the, the reason that he is delaying coming and bringing us to be with him is because he wants as many people to be saved as possible. And, and that, that is, that is, that's the holdup, just waiting for everybody to find out and put their faith in Jesus. I love it. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive. From the beginning to the end, your word never fails. And we've just seen how God kept his word from all the way in the Garden of Eden <laughs> to thousands of years later when he makes this prophecy to Ahaz, to 700 years later when it ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus. The virgin conceived with no help from any man it was just God's work through Mary. Wow. 
God kept his promise and he defeated sin and death. It took the penalty, the penalty for our sin on the cross. You keep hope alive, Jesus, because you are alive, alive forevermore. We have eternal life because you, you are, were the firstborn, the first raised from the dead to eternal life. You made the way for us to have eternal life, to experience it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the hope you have. No matter what storm you're going through, there is hope because Jesus is alive. There is hope. Sometimes he calms a storm. Sometimes he just takes you right through it. And, and he's, he's got you, and he's with you, and the storm rages anyway. And I, I'm not God. I can't explain why. But I know this. God's word never fails. Your hope is secure in Jesus Christ. Would you stand to your feet? And let, let's pray. And would you bow your heads with me online? Would you make where you are a place of prayer also? And, and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your amazing word. I thank you for the promises, Father, that you gave us from all the way back to the beginning of humanity. You gave us a promise that you kept by sending your son Jesus to come and be our Savior. Lord, at Christmas, we celebrate the miraculous way that you came. You were born of a virgin. It's impossible with man, but with you, nothing is impossible. Lord, we praise you for that, Lord. We thank you that for you, nothing is impossible. You turn things around for us. You keep your promises in your timing and in your way. Sometimes we get impatient, but you keep your promises. There's coming a day when every longing will be fulfilled. Every body will be 100% healed. Every mind 100% clear. Every person 100% free when we see you face to face. And in the meantime, Lord, we're praying for it now, but we know there's coming a day. It is going to happen. And we thank you, Lord. Right now, we're, we're talking to you by faith. One day, we're going to see you face to face. And we can't wait, Lord. We can't wait. With your head still bowed, I'm wondering if there are some of you here that you're going through a storm of any kind financial, relational, addictional, any, any kind of storm, depression. If you're going through a storm, would you just raise your hand? And I want to pray specifically for you. We, we've been reading about God's promises. Let's claim them. Let's go to God. Lord, you see my brothers and my sisters who are raising their hand right here in this room, and you even see those who are raising their hand in other locations And Lord, I pray that you would do something right now in this moment that is impossible. Lord, if it be your will, I ask you to calm that storm, to just absolutely make it settle down right now in Jesus' name. Jesus, you, you gave us precedent for this. You calmed physical storms with a word. You said, peace be still. So, Lord, I echo your words, and I speak to the storms going on in different people's lives right now. Peace, be still. Peace, be still. Peace from the Prince of Peace. Be still. Calm down. Quit raging. In Jesus' name. Lord, I know that sometimes... Like even you, Jesus, prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, can I get out of this storm, Father? And the Father said no. And the Father was with you. And, he, and he raised you to life at the end of that storm. Jesus, for those that the storm is still raging, I pray, Lord, that you would bring your presence Angels came and attended you in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, I pray you would send your angels, ministering servants. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would bring peace that is impossible while some of the storms keep raging. Lord, I give you my fear. I give you my worry. And Lord, we give you our storms. We give you everything that's going on right now. You understand it. You know the real cause of it. You know the best way to end it, that storm. 
Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for your peace that passes understanding. Peace that does not make sense in a storm. I pray for that kind of peace to flood your people who, who said, yes, I'm going through a storm. Peace of God reign in our hearts and our minds. Guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. And may joy come in the morning. And while we just keep this atmosphere of prayer, we'll have one more invitation. One of the best gifts that you could give God on this celebration of Jesus' birthday is your life, your heart, your self, your soul. Jesus came, died on the cross, because you and I sinned. But your sin is paid for. You just need to say, I accept that payment. I accept that sacrifice, and I need it. How do you, how do you become a Christian? Turn, turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to God and let him lead you. Be baptized in water. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do you want to begin to, that journey today or come back to God and rededicate your life to Jesus today? If so, would you raise your hand? And I will pray specifically for you this morning that God would come in to you as you give your life to him this Christmas. Online, would you just raise your hand to God? And I just want to coach you in a prayer. I know someone is going to pray this prayer today. Would you all just repeat after me, Jesus, Jesus. I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner and I need you. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I give you my life, and I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you made that, that decision today, we just say welcome to the family of God, the kingdom of God. And would you just let me know by filling out a Connect card and, and just check the box at, at the bottom of the page, and uh, you can drop those in the offering box as you go. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Yeah, amen. It's so, it's so great to know that we always have hope as long as that hope is anchored in Jesus. We always have hope in him. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, if you did fill out that Connect card, if you didn't, now's a good chance. Um, but you can just pop that in the offering box right in the back. Just help us get connected with you so we can walk, walk this journey with you. Also, this Friday is what? Christmas Eve, I want to see you all here. I, I invite you all to come. It's going to be a great time. Come on down. Other than that, I think that's it. God bless you. See you next week or on Friday. Love you. <laughs>